Okay. Okay, so um, it's uh, just a few minutes after 5.30, so I'm going to call the Finance Committee meeting of April 18, 2023, the order, uh, which was posted for 5.30, and pursuant to actions of the legislature suspending certain sections of the open meeting law, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to attend the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public is being permitted, but every effort is made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, and I also want to remind everybody that this meeting is being recorded so that uh, um, you're aware of that. Um, and with that said, I will, will go through the members um, who are present to make sure that they can hear and be heard and note that Bob Hegner had notified me in advance that he is unable to attend today. So uh, just going alphabetically by last name, um, you know, um, Anna. Hello, hello. I can hear you. And Lynn. Present. Uh, Matt. Present. Uh, Ernie. Present. Kathy. Here. And Alicia. Here. Okay. Um, and uh, Alicia had did, um, let me know um, just prior to the meeting that um, she's only going to be able to be here for an hour. So. Um, I've offered um, to her since we had established an order for the agenda that if she wanted to postpone an, an agenda item that she has a particular interest in that um, she could let us know. Because um, uh, I'm sorry that uh, I know you've been struggling to find a time, but uh, in any event, uh, the first agenda item is uh, to talk about two items related to um, the regional schools. Um, superintendent had been at the last council meeting and had presented the budget, which was then referred uh, for the regional schools, which was referred to the committee. And the uh, this is the meeting. And uh, Dr. Morris is not here, but uh, Doug Slaughter, um, the, representing the schools as the uh, finance school finance director, is here to answer questions about the budget. And it's both the operating budget and the capital budget um, are both items on the agenda. So uh, with that said, uh, Doug, do you have anything uh, that you want to say uh, in introduction? Andy, before, um, and you may have just said this, I apologize. The agenda does have public comment before we get into the regional school topics. Did you want to say that to the end? Um, actually, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, let me just see. I, I didn't look at the attendee list. I don't know if anybody else has. Yeah, we have one person with their hand raised, and we do have four members of the public just in case they looked at the agenda and wanted to give comment, um, you know, thinking it would be first. Okay. Um, no, thank you very much for pointing that out. And uh, to notify all members of the public that uh, we do have practiced at all of our meetings, that we have a period of public comment. I've been trying to get it to the beginning of the meeting in order to uh, make it a more regular time. So uh, appreciate the reminder. And uh, please raise your hand if you'd like to make public comment. It can be about items on the agenda, but um, anything that you think that is important for the Finance Committee, whether or not on the agenda item, certainly you're welcome to um, raise your hand and um, uh, we will be glad to hear from you. And with that, I'll start with uh, Tony Cunningham. Tony, hi, good, good afternoon. Hi, thanks, Sean. Um, yes, I was hoping to make this at the beginning of the meeting because I'm in the middle of making dinner. So uh, Tony Cunningham, North Amherst. Um, my comments are on the funding requests before you today. 
Specifically, I believe funds to demolish the gas station on Montague Road should come out of the capital budget and not free cash. The town's financial management policies and objectives state that free cash and stabilization reserve funds are for unforeseen and extraordinary expenses and to sustain services during economic downturns. The gas station was purchased six years ago. I was at the groundbreaking of the North Amherst Library last June. The need to demolish the gas station is neither unforeseen nor extraordinary. And I would expect that funds for the demolition should have been requested through the Joint Capital Planning Committee last year or this year. I encourage you to reject the financial order to take the money from free cash and instead recommend that the town manager fit it within the FY24 capital budget, which is not yet final. If the demolition is so urgent that funds are needed before July, then I suggest you recommend that Sean look into repurposing unspent capital funds to cover it. Regarding the part of this request that is for paving and landscaping to integrate the library and gas station sites, I think you should first find out more about how that fits in with the larger North Amherst intersection project. The last plan I saw showed a roadway going right through there, linking Sunder Sunderland and Montague roads. It would seem unwise to spend money on paving if it is soon to be dug up for a road, which leads me to ask, has the town prepared a MassWorks infrastructure grant application for the 2023 round? I understand the application deadline is June 2nd. With the North Square development complete, the North Amherst Library expansion almost finished and the Valley CDC housing project at Ball Lane in the works, it seems a very compelling MassWorks application to redo the North Amherst intersection could be developed. And the other financial order I want to comment on is the reuse water system. I am glad you are rescinding the balance of the 5 million borrowing authorization. This capital project should never have been paid out, paid for out of town funds, in my opinion, as it was to benefit UMass. I would really like to see this, the town pursue getting back from the university the $300,000 that has been spent on this project to date. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. And the items that you um, reflect, you at, you uh, talked about regarding an order, um, I'm sure will be discussed again when we get to the item, but it sounds like you have other things going. Anyway, thank you. Uh, Mary, thank you to join us. And uh, Hey, Mary, uh, you can. Um, Thank uh, you. Is that better? You're, you're on. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome. Thank you. Maria Kapicki, South Amherst. We've just had a debate about the use of reserves to support the new school project. The people of Amherst were told by the town council that they will be the only ones to pay for it without meaningful help from the $24 million of reserves. Some of you said that was because that money is being saved for the fire station project, despite there being no evidence of progress toward that end. At the same meeting, the orders on today's agenda were referred to the Finance Committee seeking to use reserves for other purposes, including, as Tony just mentioned, the demolition of a gas station that is in no way a surprise, a crisis, or the fire station. I want to repeat the town policies and objectives that Tony mentioned. Uh, and that was included in an October report from this committee, stating that the primary objective of the town's reserve is to provide for unforeseen and extraordinary expenses. It further states that free cash in excess of the goal reserve amount should be used for non-recurring emergency expenditures or appropriated to a stabilization fund for future capital projects and equipment purposes, purchases or used to provide property tax relief again, used to provide property tax relief. I submit that there's a very strong case to make to use more of the $24 million in reserves for the school project, which would be providing property tax relief, but not to use it to cover costs for predictable expenses that should be part of the regular capital budget process. In short, this committee and the town council need to apply your own fiscal guidelines on reserves consistently and not as a ploy when it suits some other purpose. Thank you. Thank you. I have the same comment as I made before in appreciation. Uh, so thank you for being with us. Is there anybody else who's in the audience who would like to be recognized? Uh, if not, then um, 
we'll get back to Doug Slaughter and uh, Dr. Slaughter. Is there any introductory comments that you'd like to make now about the school budget, regional school budget in capital request? Um, I don't think so. I, I think the, the thing I'll say is it's, it's uh, you know, largely unchanged from when you last uh, saw it at, at the Four Towns meeting. I think the, the biggest difference, as I noted at your at your full council meeting, was the uh, uh, increase from 2.5% to a 3% increase in the assessment for Amherst, which then had a cascading effect to uh, Shootsbury uh, and, and the amount that they would, would contribute to their assessment um, for the operating budget. Um, and that our resulting, you know, that resulting increase of about $97,000 or so uh, at this point in time, we've put into our contingency and control accounts because we're still negotiating uh, uh, several contracts. And so we're not sure um, we're ready to restore something from our, our sort of reductions list uh, when we have that outstanding sort of uh, uh, potential cost there. So it, it is in a bit of a... Uh, uh, it's in a control account so that we can, you know, if, if needed, be uh, used to resolve that those contracts and how they resolve. So that's what we've done with the additional resources that you gave to us. Um, that's why they're highlighted in some of the materials you have today. And I think that that's where I'll stop for now because I think it's it's been sort of out there for you guys to look at for a while. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has about uh, operating or capital budgets. Yeah. Shall we start and see if anybody has questions about the um, operating budget? Yeah, uh, Kathy. Uh, thanks, Doug. Um, needless to say, re reading through what you gave us is a bit daunting, um, but thank you. Um, I have a, a question just on a line to understand how you track it. You have a line for contingency and a line for reserve. Um, and you show that as for the coming year, it's in the, if I add the two together, it's about $860,000. And the year before it was 920. Do you show what happened to the year before? So of the 920, that was that would have been the current year, or if I go back several years, do you have a running account to say we were, this was what we were carrying, and this is what we had at the end of the year? Um, we do. I mean, generally speaking, <clears throat> that contingency and reserve lines are are fairly small, fairly modest. They they cover things like degree change, mid year degree changes, and and contractual obligations, some retirement incentives, that sort of thing. So generally, um, you know, in the last previously completed fiscal years uh we had in fiscal 20 it was 61,000 in, in fiscal 21 it was about two thousand dollars and in fiscal 22 it was about a thousand dollars was what we actually spent in each of those um and partly because we had other uh in, in sometimes that's smaller because we use other resources when the rest within the rest of the budget to cover some of the costs we have we also don't incur those expenses always um the reason they're so large in the current fiscal year and in next fiscal year is because in both of those years, um, we're still uh, anticipating the resolution of several contracts and those uh, are where we carry a good portion of, of our estimates for what those will, what resources will need to cover those, those, uh, those contracts. And so they're fairly large uh, for the current year and for next year because there's a, there's a pretty uh, sizable chunk of money in there for uh, you know, the resolution of those contracts. In most years, it's a fairly modest number in the you know, sort of fifty, sixty thousand dollar range, and then it depends as we go through our budget process whether things like sabbatical leaves are are included or not. Uh, we usually find out early enough that we can deduct that. So, um, I think that's a it's a tricky part of the budget to look at, and especially tricky to look at over time. And and certainly with the current year and next year, we we have a lot of uncertainty because of unsettled contracts, and so those numbers are fairly large. Uh, and then the reality is, once we settle those contracts. That mon that funding that's there will end up in our payroll accounts up at the top of the, of the chart, as it were, in, in our consolidated spending plan. So hopefully that helps paint the picture a little bit. Yeah, you have a follow-up? Uh, no, no, that that answered my question on that. I'm just waiting to see. I have a couple other questions, so I just want to see whether other people um, have questions before I uh, take, take up uh, more time. Lynn, 
Yeah. Uh, Doug, would you go back to your statement earlier when you talked about the two and a half to the three percent and the impact on Shootsbury and just explain that a little further and um, please. Thank you. So, um, you know, we have a, we have a less, less formal, but certainly consensus opinion about how we are going about our assessment method at present time. And so we use uh, this, an, a five-year average of our minimum local contributions. And then once we've uh, sort of assessed that amount of money, uh, then we use our, our uh, regional agreement method, which is a five-year rolling average of students. Uh, and that's how we apportion the cost to each of the districts. But the, the one other piece that we put into that formulation is that we have a 4% guardrail that we apply just to sort of moderate increases to, to communities, both positive and negative. In the current year, so for fiscal 24, both uh, Pelham and Leverett are at that, their increases were greater than 4%. Uh, even before the change uh, that, that you're asking about. So we knew that they would be unimpacted by, because they'd still be uh, held harmless, I guess is one way to say it, not really, but, but held to a limit of a 4% increase. So those would hold still. Um, and so with the increase in the funding that Amherst was available to to, to put forward in their assessment, um, the the impact was that Shootsbury was uh, tasked with a, a higher assessment as well. Um, Technically, all four would have gone up, but because we used the guardrails, then we held Leverett and, and shoots uh, Leverett and Pelham to a four percent increase. Um, but that increase for uh, for Shootsbury was about nine thousand fifty dollars or something about that. Um, and so I reached out to once we knew that you the, the town of Amherst had the additional resources available. I reached out to to Shootsbury uh, to get some feedback because this was you know a, a bit of late breaking news it's not un, unmanageable but later than they were expecting and after we'd had our four towns meeting i reached out to them to see about that impact uh and whether their their uh select board finance committee etc had any uh comments relative to that uh and was assured by the town administrator and issues for it they talked about it it was fine that they could uh, manage that additional increase they had other reductions in other areas of of their budget overall that allowed them to you know easily take that into consideration this year. And, and at the same time, there's still less than 1% increase over last year. So, you know, they really felt they, they could and uh, would be able to cover that additional uh, increase in, in their assessment. Oops. Uh, the thing that keeps coming back for me with the guardrails is the extent to which um, the smaller schools are protected with the guardrails. And I understand that you respect, and we really wanna thank you for respecting the fact that we have said initially 2.5 and then 3%. And um, I, some point in time, it would probably be useful to just understand what, for example, Pelham and Leverett would, would be paying if they, I, I assume the chart now shows what they would be paying since we upped ours to 3%, except for the guardrails at four. Yeah, in, in one of the handouts that had the uh, right. budget related motions, there's, a, there's a, a figure with blue stripes across it. Yeah. The left, the left one of those shows the, the amount that, that uh, Pelham and Leverett would be able, would be charged if we, if we didn't have guardrails. Okay. Uh, so you can Got see that, that full impact for them. Got it. Thank you. Emma? Yeah, um, thanks, Doug. I, I think you touched on this when you were responding to Kathy's question, and I apologize if I'm being redundant. So with, uh, with contracts that have yet to be settled, and what I'm hearing is that you are estimating, you're estimating a budget, and you are, I'm assuming, estimating high or kind of straight down the middle. I, I'm curious how that shakes out, and, and I apologize if this is too kind of big picture, but I'm trying to figure out how that shakes out and how that impacts member towns. Um, and then I have a separate sort of irrelevant question that I think I should just email Paul about with uh, with changes to that. So yeah, contracts. And can you just give me a quick overview on how that how that works, the timelines of all of it? 
So I have, I have a really large crystal ball that I use now. I'm kidding. That's what I figured. So, yeah. um, <laughs> what we know is that we, we generally have in each of our contracts a grid which has lanes and has steps involved. Right. And so we know where people sit on the current structure. Um, and so what we generally do is we, as we go from one year to the next, we say, we take a snapshot, a level services snapshot, who's working for us right now. Um, and we basically give them all a step and, and, uh, and see sort of where they are on the, on the salary grid. And then <clears throat> usually the other piece that's factored into one year to the next is a cost of living increase. Um, and so we made an estimate of what we think that cost of living increase uh, would look like. And, and we basically, when we do that, we are estimating to some extent what we think you guys can afford, you meaning the town of Amherst, the town of Leverett, Pelham, Shutesbury, et cetera. So we, we understand and recognize how Prop 2 and a half works, how new growth works. Uh, we listen carefully when you guys are, are uh, doing financial forecasting in November and, and talk about what you think is going to happen with state aid and all of those things. And so we're factoring that in and we're trying to pick a number that, that you know, is, is within the real realm of possibility. Um, and, you know, the other thing that's a big unknown for us is that we don't know how the negotiations are going to necessarily turn out. So there could be, you know, if you keep your structure of, of your salary rates the same, and then it's just a COLA, that's a pretty straightforward kind of apples to apples. Thing. But if you restructure, which we've done in a few of our contracts recently, because it's been a while, so we restructure, we still have a sort of totality of available funds that we're still working from as, as we go through our process of negotiating. Uh, as well as understanding, you know, and, and always keeping in mind as we budget sort of what, what resources are, are available. So we, and when I did an initial estimate, basically we stepped everybody to the next step. Uh, we did a, an estimate of a cost of living increase that we think would uh, not result, which seemed reasonable relative to the sort of constraints under which you and the other three communities uh, operate. Uh, and then we cross our fingers and hope the best at that point in some respects i don't mean to be glib about it but at the same time you know we're trying to you know it, uh, i can't put a 12 percent cola in because it's just not possible for any of the four towns to, to tolerate that kind of an increase to, to salaries and wages so you know we try to pick a number that's that's uh functional within the budgets that people uh are going to be operating within so when we're looking at this budget and we're also hearing that there will be positional cuts it's not a level services budget then, right? If you're cutting positions, because isn't that cutting services in some way? Or is that, diff is that different because you're expecting other educators to pick up the workload? So it, it's not quite level services. I, I will say the tricky thing this year is because we've got uh, you know, some federal grant monies from, from COVID called ESSER funds. We have those grant funds that are funding a lot of positions. Right. So what we're doing is, is people that are currently funded in the current fiscal year are currently funded from that, um, not exclusively, but largely that's where the cuts to positions are gonna happen. Um, and so then that frees up what we would have used from ESSER on salaries to then be applied to the budget more broadly. But it is, I mean, there are fewer people working for us than there are now as a result of this. And so it's not level services. It is, if you exclude the kinds of things we're doing with ESSER, then then those services are held fairly harmless. And, and again, uh, you know that's that's not to diminish the work that gets done there, but it, it, with those ESSER funds, and 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 we're going to miss that, and it will have an impact. And and so we're trying to, in in some of the choices uh, you'll see in that in that list of ads and and reductions, you'll see some positions that sort of show up in both places uh, in both an ad and a reduction. And the idea is that, well, we took it off of one source of funding, sort of this external source and put it on to our other, uh, but most of those positions are reduced. So there's some some training back and forth based on on enrollment, so those kind of things. Um, but but largely it's funded, positions that are funded by a grant that we're gonna go away in a year anyway. So it's it's sort of an early version of, of that reduction that we're gonna see. And, and yeah, it's it, we're gonna be less than, than what we were this year. Thank you for bearing with me as I run at the learning curve. Thank you. Jesse? Yeah, I I want to pick up on the, the concept of level services, but segue to some uh, questions about enrollment. Um, if enrollment declines, um, at some point, staffing you'd expect staffing to decline um you know not necessarily in each p 
position. Um, so, so I don't know how what you call that, but it's different than I think a, if enrollment was going up and you saw staffing cuts or there was stagnant. So enrollment is down about 100 total children since uh, two or three years ago, 300 and a large amount. So I was trying to track, thank you for giving me the time, but it looks to me like there's been a shift in the budget um, and I can't see the special needs versus regular, but the at during that five year the five year time period where I can see dollars is special needs and the regular account is we're spending more than we're spending for regular. So I don't know whether the special needs group is growing and the regular is declining, or the regular is about the same, you know, so I'm trying to get some sense is the composition of middle and high school changing. That was question number one. And I'll just ask the other one. We I don't have a how many over, you know, the last five years or 10 years, how many are going to the charter school from either the middle or the high school? How many are coming into us or going out of us on school choice? You know, that flow of in and out from public which would give me a better sense of what the underlying, uh, some of what the story is on what's, what's happening. Cause I know charter takes a lot of money out of the school system, probably a whole lot more. Well, I know a lot more than you see as a decrease in expenses. Um, it's not like one child, one student leaves and suddenly $24,000 less is spent. But, but I think, getting some kind of analysis would be useful. So I'm not asking for all of that right now, Doug, but that is looking over time, you know, are we starting to adjust staffing to where the actual enrollment is, is the, the big question. And then is, the, is there a shift in enrollment um, away, away from regular towards special or is it special, is special growing? And then where does charter fit into that whole equation? Right. So I'll say um, I'll take that last part first. I think in 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 this regard, I think our the number of students that we have going to charter schools has been fairly stable over the last few years. Um, and so the I think the the from just a raw number of kids standpoint, we've been pretty steady uh, with that, which is is encouraging because then it makes the sort of impact a little more predictable in some respects. Uh, when 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 you have a growing population, which was the case. You know, several years ago, especially when charter schools were new, and there were a big, you know, number of schools were 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 formed, and and you had this sort of every year increase uh, in the number of students. Uh, that's a much harder circumstance because you're trying to project and predict how many how many you have. But we've we've noticed that we've had a fairly steady level, you know, plus or minus one or two students uh, for the last few years, and so that's helpful to us uh, because the sort of budgetary impact is stabilized it's not i will say that you know the outflow of money to to charter schools is significant um but it it's more predictable because i think our enrollment in those in those programs has, has held fairly steady um and ideally we'd like to you know bring more of those kids back um or not lose them in the first place with seventh grade uh you know you you sort of lose some uh we do get some back um but what we've had a sort of steady state the last couple of years, I would suggest. And I'm hopeful that we can continue that, if not uh, shrink that population. Um, back to your other questions around uh, sort of population shifts and who we've got, that sort of thing. Um, and again, this plays into charter a little bit, because again, you know, if you look at charter schools, I, I think the the uh, number of special education students that they have and the severity of the, of the needs of those students is probably uh, and this is a very, very broad generalization. Uh, it's likely less than what we have to work with here. Um, so the kids that, that you know, and I, I, I'll pick on Springfield because they've got a science and technology uh, charter school in Springfield. I doubt that they're attracting a lot of, you know, highly, highly uh, needy students from a you know, special education standpoint. They might, but uh, it oftentimes is a complication that's, that's too great to to manage in a charter school. So I think that's one of those, you know, when you get into the charter formula and some of that sort of stuff that gets a little problematic in, in my opinion. So that's a little bit of an opinion by me personally. So I'll be think of that a little bit. But um, but as far as our, our population in the building uh, and special education costs, uh, there's a couple of different pieces to that. I don't know that we've had a strong increase necessarily in the number of special education students. Um, I do think, and if you ask our, our, our uh, 
Student Services Director Faye Brady, she'd say that the acuity or the significance or the um, complexity of some of the kids' needs have increased over the last couple of years. The pandemic's not done us any favors in that regard. Um, so the, the, the level of need, uh, the kinds of support kids need has gone up. That's increased our costs there to some extent. Um, I think strongly impacting us for fiscal 24 in particular was uh, for our district placements that are out of district. Uh, those costs uh, for those programs uh, are set by the state. Uh, they did a 14% increase this year on those on those costs. So even if we held the number of students fairly steady, which we do, and with the programs that we operate within our within our district, we have a lot fewer uh, out of district placement students. Um, but nonetheless, those those were pretty significant increases in those costs uh, for the coming year, and that really really impacted this year's increase. I don't know if you looked at the special ed in particular, but it's double digit increase in costs, and that's a lot of that's driven by by those costs. There are other costs in special education that have also risen um, and needs we have for students uh, because I think the, the severity and, and acuity of the kind of program problems and and, and uh, supports that they need have increased. Uh, so it's a it's a combination of factors. I don't think the the raw headcount hasn't changed that much. Um, I think some of the costs that go with those kids has gone up a little more aggressively than some some of the other regular education costs. So I think that drives that that piece of the budget a little harder than than the regular education costs. To the uh, uh, question of sort of reducing um, overall enrollment going down and, and sort of impact, it's sort of a stair step method. You know, you don't. Um, it's not, you know, you lose 100 students, you can reduce it by exactly 4% or whatever the magic number is. It's not, it doesn't work that way because classes aren't, you know, one kit, right? So class sizes are sure. you know, of a certain size. Um, I think what you see at the middle school this year, in particular, if you look at the, the reductions and, and uh, you know, they're at, there's a half a team, which is two teaching staff. That's, you know, part of that is being uh, leveraged to go to a dean's position, but, but, um, the ability to reduce those two staff, um, sort of regardless of our budget, we would have probably moved that forward as a, as a reduction we need to do because we just don't have the students to merit it. And certainly it's a cost we can't uh, incur at this point uh, in good conscience. So it keeps our class sizes, given the reduced number of students, our class sizes are gonna hold fairly common to what they are this year. Um, and so we're looking for those. And, and I think that's the that's a difficulty as you uh, continue to have a declining enrollment, you know, what's our programmatic uh, structure we're trying to be are we still able to be a comprehensive high school um can we offer the broad you know the breadth and depth of, of courses that we offer um do we have to change our paradigm around certain things whether it be special education regular education etc all those things are on the table I and mean, we see the you know if you look at the fact that we're you know leveraging over a million dollars in in one-time money to help balance this budget um and that's where we start you know fiscal 25 uh there's a there's a real deep uh, philosophical set of questions we're going to be asking ourselves as we go into fiscal 25 of uh, what's our school supposed to look like, how do we stay competitive relative to charter schools and, and choice to other districts, um, and, and how do we keep offering the things we want to offer in, in our program. Uh, those are those are the hard questions coming up for sure and, and things we're you know, already starting to think about in, in some way because we, we can see the writing on the wall, as they say. Hopefully that paints a little bit of that picture around some of those topics. No, you did answer. Um, Andy, can I just follow up with one question? I, I think I know the answer to it still. Uh, if the sixth grade moves up, um, you know, I understand what you ran into in terms of you need to treat it like a school within a school, but can mm -hmm. sixth graders take language courses? Could let sixth graders take art courses? Could they take music courses so that those those uh, programs would have a somewhat more re potential robust, robust enrollment um, because you just have three grades and sixth graders are, in my opinion, more than capable of doing the music and art programs. And they could certainly start a language if they didn't already, if they're not already coming up out of the Comandantes program, which they wouldn't be. But is there the potential for doing that? I think there's some. I think that's some of what has been discussed. Uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm not as familiar particularly around. I know they've spent a lot of time thinking about how to potentially offer some world language, some introduction to that for sixth grade, because there's some some staff, you know, in the building already doing it for seventh and eighth grade. And how do they 
fit together and yet still keep you know the the uh, appropriate balance and and not uh, you know we do have Pelham Lumber and Shootsbury they're going to have some peers join and so we don't want to over advantage certain kids over others in some respects that's part of the mix too um, but I think there are some economies there I think it's it's uh, around you know some shared staffing I think we're hopeful for that and and I think we're still exploring that a little bit and to what extent. Um, licensure plays in a little bit, but there's a fair amount of licensure that's sort of fifth to eighth grade. So hopefully a lot of people that, you know, where we can leverage that overlap and fractionally pay some of them from Amherst and some of them from region, you know, we'll definitely do that whenever and wherever we can. I think the hard thing is the administration piece because it is its own school to kind of build and have some of these uh, other staff that, you know, sit in those administrative roles and, and hold that responsibility and report on those things, um, you know, don't go away. So, you know, you kind of trade one thing for another in some respects. So hopefully in the, in the net, we can end up in a positive place financially, but, but it's, uh, it's moderated by the fact that it's a separate school. Um, and I think, you know, as the superintendent said this too, is that there's opportunities for the state has, has taken a little, uh, Kinder view to uh, targeted types of uh, modifications to a regional agreement, and so that that may be an opportunity to sort of rethink how we how we work with the sixth grade in our in our middle school building, and whether we can uh, potentially find a way. And and this be partnered with our other three communities to to do this. But can we you know make a small adjustment or small adjustments to the to the regional agreement in a way to bring that sixth grade in and and you know sort of get the benefit of, of shared staff without quite as much overhead of, of administration. So those are all, you know, in the mix, uh, I would say, and we're still trying to get a little more sense of that, but it's, it is a, a question that, that is um, not as daunting as it once was, because it, it formerly with, with opening a regional agreement, it was a, a, a very big and lengthy and tedious and, and expensive prospect to do. And, and if we can be, I think, kind of focused in that regard. And again, this is something that myself or the superintendent can't really initiate. It's got to be kind of school committee and council and, and uh, select boards and that sort of thing that, that sort of want to, to move in that direction. But, um, you know, that that may be an option that, that makes that sixth grade move a little more uh, viable and financially beneficial across the board. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, so I want to pick up on the sixth grade uh, move and just make sure I understand that because what you just said, because Desi has uh, perhaps made altering a regional agreement a little less onerous, um, that we when we move the sixth grade to the um, middle school, we may actually be able to treat them more like part of the regional district. And then the question is, how do the other three elementary schools um, plan to play in that? Do they, you know, will we become, and are we looking at, are we having conversations? about the possibility that we will become a six to 12 regional school um, in you know two years or whatever it would be. So that's kind of what I'm hearing is that. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think that, that the that DESI is a little more open to narrower uh, adjustments to regional agreements. So that's, I think, beneficial. I think that opens a wide variety of potential outcomes. Um, it could be that we make Amherst, the only one that's a sixth grade to 12th grade, and everybody else stays with seven to 12. I, I mean, I think we want to explore that whole range of options, I would suggest, um, and see, you know, the, the, you know, the willingness and, and, and uh, uh, interest by the other communities, I think, would be part and parcel of that conversation. It could be that, yes, yeah, six to 12 would, for the whole of all four towns might be the direction we end up. It might be a thing where it's not that, and I think we you know, each of the towns going to have to explore that question, and then collectively have to explore those questions together. Because um, I think the you know the the financial piece of that uh, is is pretty significant. And you know if you sort of think about when you have a single school 
in a Palo Verde single school in Leverett or a single school in Shrewsbury, you take one seventh of that out of the building, some things aren't better off. You know, you still have a full time nurse, you still have a full time librarian, or right. or whatever circumstances. I mean, there are certain positions that don't get reduced by one seventh when you do that. Um, you know, you, you you have a sixth grade. You know, and, and what do you do with the staff? Do they get hired by the regional district? And you know, there's some economies there that that reduce the classroom needs, perhaps. And so there's a whole host of questions that go with that. And some of them are first year problems, you know, sort of once you make, you know, the transition years is the hard one. But some of them are also sort of what's the more systemic, you know, impact on that school that's staying in the, you know, in and the kids that are staying in the building that's in the in the in those towns. And and in Amherst with three elementary schools, that's a that's a more modest impact. And and we quite frankly need the space in some schools. Uh, and it's necessary for for the new building. Um, uh, at the Fort River site, you know, because it's a K, it's a K five school. So, you know, in Amherst, it's a pretty clear direction we've got um, in in the need to move to the sixth grade. I think for the others, it's a more open question, but I think we got to engage those towns in that regard. Right, and, and but I'm correct that we've delayed that move until the new elementary school opens. Yeah. Okay, which makes lots of sense. Uh, I do have a totally other issue, but go ahead, Doug. I was just going to say, I think it'll take us that time, the sort of two years of time, because you know, yeah. we're going to build a building, hoping that I'm, I'm presuming that the override will pass. So we're going to build a building, and there's a lot of things that go with that. So I think sort of in that same time framework, you know, the series of questions around a sixth grade uh, being part of a regional uh, school district and how to, you know, address those questions and ask them and pose it and get those resolved. That's all part of that two-year process, I think. And, so we'll we'll simultaneously deal with that along with getting the school building built and and uh, try to manage the budgets we have too. Okay. Um, so I this is really a research question, and I'm not clear it's even fair to ask it of you. Uh, but I do have some serious concerns about the comparison of the demographic makeup of charter schools versus public, regular public schools, and whether it's leading to um, segregation at some level. And I didn't know whether you were aware if anybody um, was looking at that or if that data, I'm assuming I could go on the DESE website and find that data. Yeah, you can. I think, you know, the charter schools re report their, their enrollments and, and their groups of kids uh, uh, the same way that we mm -hmm. do. Um, so that data is all sitting there and, and available. And I think, I think it depends on the school too. I mean, I think some schools, um, some of the charter schools are much more parallel to, to say our district or parallel to other districts. Uh, mm -hmm. Some are not. And I think, you know, I think that, and there's good and bad about that. I don't want to state one thing or another about that, but it, but it also, you know, there's conversations and, and, and action that people want to take around the, the funding formula. I think that should be a factor in the consideration of that uh, in that funding formula because um, yeah. I think it's uh, you could I think you can make a fairly simple argument that it places an undue burden on the on the home district um, you know depending on what charter schools are available um, something that Mr. Mangano and I have talked about is that transportation is a big deal so it it Speaking of segregation, so economically, not just you know, sort of special ed or other kinds of things. Uh, you know, if you've got the means to get your your child to the charter school, you can go to a charter school. If you don't have a way to get there, you can't get there. That's a that's a tough uh, circumstance, and that's not necessarily fair uh, when you're trying to you know make these schools uh, accessible to everyone. So I think there are some some definite questions in my mind anyway around some of those equity type uh, issues that that arise. Right. Okay. Um, uh, my next other questions are more about capital. So I'm. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to try and move it along to capital. I have one question on operating and then uh, see if we can uh, get agreement to just go and move to capital so that we can uh, move through the agenda fully today. Um, the uh, revenue presumptions that you made. Um, on uh, revenue that is not from uh, town assessments. Of course, a large part of it is uh, the, the lines of uh, state support that you receive 
in the uh, region has the same problem that cities and towns have, that we're commanded to develop budgets um, before the state finishes its budget process. And as a consequence, we're sitting here never sure about uh, how much we're going to be getting for our um, unrestricted government aid or Chapter 70. You're not sure about Chapter 70 or uh, regional transportation or other lines that are within the budget. Uh, this year, as I looked at the cherry sheet that was just published on Saturday for the House Ways and Means budget, there's a significant increase in uh, one of the lines, which is regional transportation. And uh, I know from my role in the Mass Municipal Association, we're doing a lot of work and uh, a lot of effort in trying to get a per dollar increase for the minimum aid districts, which includes the region and the town. Um, from where it start, uh, the the low number of thirty that was put into the governor's budget, uh, it's now been doubled, and you know we're hoping that it's going to be getting up to the hundred dollar mark that uh, the uh, MMA has asked. Uh, what can or the region do in adjusting um, its budget if that revenue comes in higher than you projected at the time that you put together the budget that you're presenting to us? So there's a couple of things we can do. Um, I think with, with, with chapter 70, that difference between 30 and $60 per student works out to about $40,000 for us. So that's a that's a pretty small impact in, I mean, I, you know, $40,000 is, you know, a couple of paraprofessionals jobs. So I don't want to be, I don't want to diminish the size of $40,000 or the importance of it. Um, but at the same time, it, it, there are other areas in which, it, you know, in our estimates of, 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 of revenue where that uh, can kind of balance out a little bit. But I think the, the big one I would say, and, and uh, uh, that I've been thinking about is, is transportation uh, reimbursement. Now we typically have, you know, we receive the money and we spend the money kind of in the same year. Um, but we have established, thanks to Mr. Mangano's work when he was in this role, uh, we have established a transportation um, revolving fund that allows us to treat it much like we do the uh, special education circuit breaker, which is uh, you sort of earn it one year, you receive it the next year, and you can spend it the following year. And so you do have a, a time limit on when you spend it. So there's potential for us, especially if, if we have a bit of a windfall for lack of a term or, or an overage in, in uh, transportation funding in particular, we can start to build that 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 uh, revenue up and maybe move to a circumstance where um, we treat it like we do circuit breaker, where we we sort of park it for a year and use it and budget it explicitly to the dollar amount. So that that helps mitigate that that sort of uh, volatility that we see. Um, you know, I think that uh, you know I'm always hopeful if if revenues come in higher than expected. Uh, in worst case, they they end up becoming uh, E and D because um, we can't spend more than what we. Uh, uh, authorized for on the on the expense side, um, the revenue sources can can be different than than budgeted. We make estimates of those. Obviously, uh, some are under, some are over. We try to be you know fairly close and and really importantly, uh, sort of hit the mark relative to to uh, uh, our overall need there and and reasonable uh, expectation of income in that regard. But any overages in the in that uh, in those revenues. Uh, that aren't budgeted as, as expenses can be either, uh, like I say, you know, sort of uh, put into like the transportation uh, revolving fund and then leverage for the coming year, or they go to E and D and and are are uh, part and parcel of our our budgeting for the subsequent years. Um, and so we're trying to you know strike those balances and and understand that uh, you know that revenue is as it comes in to to make our choices and make our plans around our E&D spending both in the current year and, and in our subsequent years. And and um, and as you know, there is an upper limit on how much E&D there is. And so uh, if if we um, have been overly conservative in our in our estimates of, of expenses, then and our E&D gets too high, we're compelled to, to give some of that back um, to the to the communities. Um, but I think, you know, this may be a good segue into this capital is that, you know, there's there's opportunity to take that kind of uh, those those kind of revenues and think about capital projects, smaller ones uh, that we can fund that way and reduce the the capital um, expenditure uh, and the borrowing that we might need to do. So those are all ways in which we might leverage revenues. Um, 
as long as we don't spend more than we, we had authorized. So well, that takes a little bit of some of the options we have available to us. Thank you. Uh, let me see if Bernie has a question and we can move on to capital. Um, not so much a question as a, as a, a comment. I'm looking at the cherry sheets and um, the House Ways and Means Committee is allocating 4% more in state aid than what you're currently what you're currently getting. You're being more generous to the schools than they are to the towns because they reduced our uh, general aid. Um, so it's not, you know, all, all things, it's not a huge amount of money, but it um, it may be welcomed. And uh, I'm glad to know that you're, uh, you've got some contingency plans and that some of this might get uh, set aside for future, future use. That's it. So if there's, unless somebody has anything else, let's uh, see if the questions about the capital side. Lynn, you had said you had some questions there. Yeah, um, I do. Um, they're not specific. They're more of, and this is no surprise, um, that it's really looking down the road and how we're planning for that. And are there, you know, obviously we're all hoping that we continue to have a wonderful relationship with the Mass School Building Authority and that maybe they can help with some of the things that need to be done. Uh, but I am very concerned about the long-term um, picture of our debt uh, for the regional schools. Uh, particularly when it comes at a time when the town of Amherst may be taking on more significant debt as well. Yeah, uh, I, I don't disagree with you at all um, in that regard. And, and I think that uh, I'm hopeful that that even as early as this coming year, you know, we have a, a project that that's I think it's HVAC Energy Master Planning. Sounds Sounds noble, doesn't it? Um, but I think the idea is is that we can be with some with a process like that, you know. So there's a, there's a couple of pieces moving here. One is, you know, we have two buildings that are uh, uh, 50 plus and 65 plus years old, or parts of them are, um, and so they're in need of some TLC. And there's no kind of getting around it. And they're big and they take a lot. So I think that's one piece to keep in mind. I think the other is that, you know, we want to shift uh, to uh, environmentally more responsible modes of, of heating and cooling our buildings, uh, great, greater comfort, greater energy efficiency, et cetera. And so some of the ideas with, with uh, a master plan like that is to try to you know, come up with some more targeted and focused understanding of, of the direction we can take with regard to that, which will refine the numbers and hopefully make them uh, not quite so ominous. Uh, but nonetheless, they may stay that, with, but they'll hopefully be more uh, grounded in fundamentals of, of research that we've done. Uh, so that's that's another piece. I, I think back to the, the age of our buildings and, and this was a, a point raised at the at the uh, uh, at the four towns meeting and I think the you know about whether to uh, with a shrinking enrollment do we you know reconsider whether to move our seventh and eighth grade over to the uh, to the high school space, add a bit on to the building. Uh, currently, you know, when we looked at that a couple of years ago, the, the the cost of bringing the existing building fully up to code was pretty prohibitive relative to that. I mean, a, a really big number. However, you know, as I was talking in a, a regional school subcommittee on budget, and uh, you know, one of the members said, "Well, there, there's maybe a tipping point on that 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 it doesn't seem so bad, uh, depending on what our real capital costs start to look at." So I think we're we're going to continue to you know keep our buildings as safe and healthy and functional as we can, uh, make improvements to those things uh, as as coherently and logically as we can, and then also continue to weigh those sort of more fundamental shifts in, in how we utilize our buildings and how we might structure ourselves, uh, you know, in, in our spaces and what it would take. Um, so I think those are all, you know, questions that are in our mind and, and are, are in our thoughts as we as we do this capital planning. You know, the current capital plan that you saw in the years out are, are kind of keeping status quo in a lot of ways. And so I think 
you know, we're going to be pressed over the next few years, and it won't be terribly long because we're going to, I think we'll get a, a sense of whether MSBA will return to their accelerated repair program, because uh, that's going to be critical for the roof, both middle school, high school, windows and doors at the, at the, uh, at the high school. All of those are, you know, the, that's a critical potential funding source to help us uh, keep those buildings going. And, and like I said, the current sort of trajectory is, is based on a kind of status quo. Uh, if we see our enrollments continue to drop, if we can see uh, some sense of what MSBA might look like and what they might be able to fund in coming years, it may shift our thinking about what we do and how we how we want to work with the physical space we have uh, and what we do with the buildings we have. Um, so those are all in the mix as we move ahead, and, and certainly are are on my mind, certainly on the uh, you know superintendent's mind and, and our facilities director's mind. We're, we're kind of letting those things percolate and. and swirl around a little bit in our heads and, and be aware of those and, and try to be cognizant of that. Because uh, it, it, it is a, uh, you know, as you look at those out years, there's some pretty significant numbers. And, and you know, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty sure they're probably bigger than any of the four towns can afford, unless something dramatic happens that in a good way for the finances of all the four towns. So uh, we're going to have to, you know, uh, you know, strike the right balance and think about you know these these infrastructure changes in a in a pretty profound way. You know, I talked earlier about a paradigm shift and how we what we do and and how we do our program studies. This this is a you know an integral part of the the physical plant process as well. It's going to be a paradigm shift in how we think about our buildings and what we can do within them and what makes sense financially for for our, the four towns in the district to do, move ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I actually had. Uh identified the same issue and uh, I am concerned about developing a very what was a very thoughtful capital plan where you looked at all of the things that the schools need over a long period of time and then came up with a solution that um, did not have a debt um, repayment schedule that was um, something that was uh, smooth uh, in would therefore have um, some really unaffordable peaks for towns and um, unsustainable increases um, in some years. And uh, I, I look ahead and think, gee, I'm not likely to be on the Council of Finance Committee when it really hits hard, but I got to think about um, the town and whoever is going to be responsible for those decisions at the time. and. Uh, uh, I, I really do worry about the sustainability of what's coming forward, which gets into the other question again, is that uh, with shrinking enrollment and the cost of maintaining two, building, two aging buildings, aren't we um, continuing to kick the can down the road by not having a more serious discussion about that combining into one building question? Yeah, and I think I think the thing is is that you know we do need to. I mean, I think the short answer, you know, and the short term answer is, it's still too expensive to co collapse the two. But when will that shift? And sort of when does what uh, combination of factors, you know, whether it be enrollment or uh, costs of of maintenance and and repair, uh, you know, what is what is our uh, combination of factors that that tips us into a direction that may be different than what we have now. I think that's a critical question that we've got to bring up and, and, and in some ways resurrect the conversation we had a couple of years ago, just because I think that, that, that there are options that are pretty bold in, in like moving us, you know, moving a seventh and eighth grade or moving a sixth, seventh and eighth grade uh, across the street is a pretty bold change in, in, in a lot of different ways. And it makes the, you know, um, and so that's, but it's, I, I think as we look at those out years in the in the capital plan that we will sort of laid out, you know, it, the increases in in cost are pretty profound. You know, uh, they're smoother, but they're still large. <laughs> uh, so so they don't jump around, but they they steadily increase to to big numbers in a hurry. And and um, and I would you know to be perfectly honest, they're certainly probably too big for any of the four towns to be able to manage at this point. So we've got to moderate those to some extent in the shorter term, and and obviously in in the next few years really 
uh, weigh those questions of, of where do we go? Because I think there's some pretty profound uh, questions about about our buildings and, and our um, enrollment size and that sort of stuff that we, we really have to revisit those questions from a couple of years ago. There's no doubt. Thank you. Um, Kathy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'm going to just continue on this same conversation um, and bring M MSBA back into it. Um, you know, the it it strikes me that we need to be working at the state level with our representatives to increase the flow of money into the MSBA program. I mean, I know it's a share of the the uh, sales tax, but they. Uh, squeeze back on the accelerated repair so that they could be up the, which we benefited from for the elementary school because they upped the construction per square foot, but not nearly to where the construction costs are. And then at the last minute, we discovered this change in low income metric, um, which is tied to the MSBA reimbursement rate, um, changed the percent of the already reduced amount that they were willing to do. And so it, so I sort of have a question on that metric because one of because the uh, free lunch and breakfast programs are driving it less as we get everybody on them. And mass health is a big one. Do we um, if you're a family with children and your employer provides you with health insurance, your children potentially can be on your own policy. But they might also be eligible for Mass Health, and you just you leave them on your own policy. Do we do anything to assess that? Um, you know, it's at least last time I looked, which is about three or four years ago, when I knew this better. Um, you still had the option to put your children on because of the children's side of the Mass Health program. So it. So it's just a question on do, do we potentially have an undercount was my question. Um, and is there any way of dressing that? Because that we're, we, you, you've you probably followed this, Doug, but we're kind of just barely above a state average in the way the new metric is, is doing. So um, we had what, Sean, we had one transitional year <laughs> that they went up and then they went back down again. So, so if we got more money in MSBA and there was an accelerated reimbursement program back on, making sure that percent is as high as possible would be good. So it's, it's just a question of a strategy on the MSBA, MSBA level that is related to this one, it's tied to this one metric um, in a way that I had not understood until we got into the weeds. <laughs> yeah, it took Desi, uh, sending the Desi expert to explain exactly how it worked. Um, and, and just to build on that, Doug, it would have to be something that would, so that the the comparison is the, the district's uh, free and reduced lunch number compared to the state average. Um, so it would have to be something that only was unique about Amherst. That wouldn't also be true of the entire state. Um, and so, you know, Doug, you can probably explain it, but the state has gone back and forth with how it captures low income information for students. It used to use the, the standard free and reduced lunch forms. They thought that system was um, sort of not very accurate. So they went to a direct certification method where, you know, literally Doug uploads a list of, you know, even when, you know, before Doug was in his role, he did this. Mm -hmm. um, Doug would upload a list of all our students and they would compare all of our students um, to the state database for um, nutritional assistance and for mass, um, mass health and some other state assistance programs. Um, and then they would send back here are all your students that qualify. And so, um, so they thought that was a more accurate system. And then they switched back sometime during COVID. Doug, you probably know more about that. Um, yeah, I think that you know, the, to to some extent, they sh they shifted it because they realized um, what they gained or lost in in using that complete direct certification model was was the differential was more, more profound than they realized. I think a number of districts, right, rightly so, advocated on their own behalf to to get a better uh, better metric involved, and so they kind of went back. I think the I think one of the things we can do as a district. Um, and this is really I'm looking at, you know, sort of all three that I work with is is be really as, for lack of a term, aggressive about getting those forms filled out. Um, 
you know, the, the direct certification is great in a lot of ways. It saves a lot of headaches and a lot of uh, chasing of people relative to getting forms filled out. Uh, at the same time, it's imperfect. Uh, you know, there's still, you know, aspects of it, depending on how a parent fills out their paper form when they apply for SNAP benefits, can make a big difference as to whether or not we get a direct certification because of how we match things up. And, and there's not a great system for aligning those sometimes when we, when we find differences. Um, but I think that we also have with, with the university and the colleges in this area, it, it really, you have people that are temporarily uh, poor by, by virtue of being graduate students with children and, and limited amounts of resources and they make that choice and, and they need those supports. And oftentimes uh, they're, they're not aware that those supports exist. Um, so I think that's one of the th kinds of things we can do around our free bridges applications is to really uh, actively seek out, you know, getting those forms to people having to fill them out, uh, you know, because, because again, they can, they can refuse the benefit if they choose to, but identifying them as, as being qualified is pretty important because it's not only for things like MSBA, but it also, uh, there's a, you know, there's Title I grant money that's tied to that kind of number. There's also a thing called E-rate, which is some support around some, some uh, te technological uh, supports that is very helpful for us. Um, there's a lot of reasons for us to spend some time and effort on, on, Getting forms out to people, getting them filled out, getting them, getting them back, because uh, the because the you know first and foremost we want to get kids food uh, and and inexpensively if possible. Uh, hopefully we'll go to a universal free meals at a federal level. I think it's such high leverage spending by the government when they do that. It's really been phenomenal. I think for our students and across the Commonwealth and across the nation to to have done that. But but independent of that, I think you know knowing the economic status of kids and and um, the supports that come around with that, whether it be Title I or rate or or building programs, uh, are are pretty critical um, to you know districts being able to to function well and and provide you know in the case of MSBA the infrastructure we need. Um, so I think that there are things we can do to to be actively. Uh, pursuing the, the data uh, to, to help ourselves out in that regard. I think to your other point, I think, you know, I would suggest, you know, um, MSBA needs some, you know, it does need additional funding. I think the, there's probably a lot of schools that got built when ours did, you know, baby boomers and and uh, were, were a lot of schools got built in the late 60s and early 70s around uh, people, you know, my age going to school and uh, those buildings are now 50, 60 years old. They need a lot of work. So, and, you know, accelerated repair program is pretty critical. And, and so I think the state, uh, you know, is going to need to find some other funding sources than just a sales tax to support that. So they need to find another, other mechanisms to, to support the, the MSBA program, I think. That's, again, a sort of personal opinion about that, but uh, for what it's worth. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to go into this topic too much because it, it's nothing that we can do about at yep. this time, and uh, I certainly am interested in the topic because of my role in the uh, Fiscal Policy Committee, the MMA. Uh, are there any other questions about the budget? Because I think that we're getting along in time, and uh, we have a lot to do today yet. Um, if there are no other questions about the regional school operating capital budget, we have three orders that we need to make recommendations on to the council for the meeting, um, the ne next council meeting. I believe it's on the agenda. So I was going to take those, make those motions, but Lynn. So I was going to ask Andy whether there's two options. Okay. We've scheduled um, public forums for the 24th. Um, on the regional school budget, on the capital budget. And there's, I guess there's one that's also scheduled for the other items. Do you want, we we can either vote tonight and then as we have done in the past, um, have a moment where we just reconsider anything before it goes to the council and then have the council vote on the 24th the other option is we don't vote tonight. We do the public forums. We vote on the 25th 
and we actually vote at the council then on the 1st of May. So I'm, I'm looking for your thoughts on that because those options are available. Um, I don't have a strong feeling because I don't think that it's, I think that we probably know where this is gonna go either way. On this, in this question of timing, is if there's other strong, if there's anybody with strong feelings about this, because my inclination would be just go ahead and make the recommendations tonight and let's get moving. Do you not agree with that, Lynn? I, I'm, I'm absolutely fine with whichever way you would like to proceed. Andy. Is there anybody who would object to taking that up? Because otherwise I'm going to go ahead and make three three motions, get votes on those motions quickly. Then we have one other item that Doug's going to hang on for, which is the first of the orders that has to do with uh, the cannabis uh, impact uh, fee. And uh, because it's actually a request to then be able, as, as Sean will explain, uh, at least to, a funding request from the schools. So I'm going to start by say I'm making a motion, or th uh, the first of the three motions. This one is in regard to the um, assessment method. I move that the Finance Committee recommend that the Council adopt approval order FY24-01, an order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School District Assessment Method. Second. So there's been a motion that is made and seconded, uh, I believe that was Lynn. And uh, I think we've had, if there's no other hands going up, requesting any final discussion on the motion, I'm just going to go and proceed um, in order and get the votes. I also um, want to note that as we, uh, as Lucia told us in advance, she left the meeting at approximately 20 after uh, uh, six and uh, should be noted as not being present. Um, so back to the motion. Um, I'll start with Lynn. Yay. Bob uh, Hector I is absent. Matt, are you? Uh, Andy, I'm I'm going to support it. Can I? I'm going to ask a question with my support, though. Are Are we committed to uh, reevaluating the four percent? Um, guardrail method annually just with the four towns meeting and all that um i think that the answer is yes because it was recommended um as a one year this is a one year request for a um change to the regional assessment method and therefore it has to be back every year Okay, thank you. I, I, that's what my my understanding, but I wanted to confirm that we're not, um, you know, going to just stick with this as a matter of course forever. I, I support. Okay, uh, let's say here from uh, Doug or Sean, I'm going to assume that my answer is correct. And I, um, I will say though, I just have to say, this being the second year we've used this method, um, to hear Matt say forever, and I don't know why it just brings a chuckle to my my soul when we've got a method that we've had for two years. Nothing against what you said, Matt, I totally agree. Um, but it's just, we've had so many different methods the last, um, I don't know, six years, seven years that um, it's a success that we've gotten to the same method two years in a row. Um, whether that's the method we stick with, it, that's a success. Um, point, point, point taken, yeah. Bernie? Perpetual assessment question and I support. Kathy? Yes. I mean, yes. Alicia is absent. And Anna. Hi. So I think that we have four yes, none opposed. Uh, we have two members 
uh, one one voting member uh, asked, yes. and uh, from the resident members, we have two members in support and one member absent. Uh, second motion, I move that the Finance Committee recommend that the Council adopt approval, appropriation, and transfer order FY24-02 Amherst Pelham Regional School District budget, budget assessment order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School. Um, I think we got it. Actually, just the um, budget assessment. Second. So, there's a second to the motion again by Lynn. Um, and uh, so moving down one, Bob Hagner is absent. Matt? Support. Uh, Bernie? Support. Kathy? Yes. I'm a yes. Alicia is absent. Anna? Aye. And uh, Lynn? Aye. Okay. I, same vote, so I won't repeat what it was, but it, do note that it was the exact same vote as in the last uh, uh, motion. And the third motion um, I do note is um, not a mandatory motion, but one that we have done in the past as a matter of um, just take, going on the record as to whether we have an opinion about it. But um, unless we were actually, unless the council votes no, um, it, it happens the way that the rules work. But I move that the Finance Committee recommend that the Council adopt approval order FY24 03A Amherst Pelham Regional School District Capital Debt Authorization. Second. So, motions made and seconded. Um, seeing no hands going up, asking for any uh, discussion. So, seeing none. Uh, Bernie? Support. Kathy? Yes. I'm a yes. Alicia is absent. Anna? Aye. Uh, Lynn? Aye. Uh, Bob is absent. And Matt? Support. Okay. So um, that, and that's again the same vote as on the others. So, um, Sean, do you want to do an introduction of the next item just uh, briefly and then let and ask Doug for, to explain the program side of it? Yeah, so um, the town has been receiving uh, impact payments from a cannabis dispensary since we had our first dispensary. Um, it's related to the host community agreements and was part of the original legislation. Um, the requirement for the impact payments is that they go if, if they're not appropriated that they fall to free cash each year and so we've been accumulating these impact payments in free cash for uh, the last three or four years and what we are proposing is to put them the sum of our impact payments to date into a revolving fund appropriate them into a revolving fund so they can be spent for the the purpose of uh, mitigating the impacts of the dispensaries and so there's a couple that are being proposed um uh, for FY23 that uh, one I'll talk about and one Doug will talk about. Um, but the key here is that the funds are really restricted to being used for that purpose. It's not it's not something we have the flexibility to, to play with. Um, they're from the dispensaries and that was the intent of the legislation uh, that they be used to, to mitigate those impacts. The, the state just didn't have a good mechanism for how municipalities could track them. Uh, so we think by putting them into this revolving fund that will allow us to track them better um, and then we can have a, a single place where all these expenditures are, are listed and recorded um, for future use. Uh, so for FY23, I'll do mine real quick because it's really simple. Uh, we've uh, assigned some duties to an existing staff member to oversee the community host agreements. Um, we have about four active ones currently um, for both medical and recreational dispensaries in town uh, and 
this person oversees uh, the renewal of those agreements, the, the terms of those agreements, when the impact payments are due, uh, they reach out to them if they're not paid on time, uh, they, they deal with any issues associated with the, with the host community agreements. Um, so we've estimated that cost to be about 15, 10 or 15% of that person's job, or sorry, 15 or 20% of that person's job, um, or about $10,000. Uh, that we would move to this fund and that would be something we would do annually which would relieve some pressure on the the operating budget and the second one i will turn to doug which came from the schools sorry about that i muted myself and, and i had to find my mouse all right so uh not too long ago the superintendent wrote a, a request for funding uh from those funds uh regarding uh, some educational uh, activities we'd like to do and also some, some equipment we'd like. But I think that the broader thing is that uh, we see this. And and so if you get that memo, I don't know that it was in the packet tonight, but but I'm happy to share that with you, Sean, if you yeah. don't have it handy. Um, but the superintendent kind of lays out some of the rationale for an immediate use of, of some funding uh, to do some training with some staff to get uh, some curriculum materials and, and uh, get trained up on that and then imp implement those, uh, but also some 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 physical technology uh, that we can use uh, in in the schools in particular. So we've we've, we've reached out and done a survey of our students, and, and there's been some surveys in and around the area since the since the legalization of of uh, recreational use and medical use marijuana. Um, you know, and students have talked about the fact that it's easier to get a hold of it uh, than it used to be. Um, the uh, their evaluation of the risk of of marijuana use in in particular through the through the method of vaping is is considered that it's not uh, many of them consider it's not uh, risky uh, behavior and and so I think that uh, one would suggest that that may or may not be true but but it also they may or may not be well informed in making that that uh, judgment of that and so I think there's some areas in which uh, we can do some curriculum uh, work with kids uh, to to fully inform them on on what is and what is not uh, risky, and and what are the the uh, implications and and legal uh, circumstances around uh, marijuana use in, in the area, and and what is and isn't allowed. Uh, we think the partners, you know, the 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 uh, currently active uh, businesses in town have been very good about you know uh, complying with the with the uh, with the law and and you know carting people and. Doing the same kind of things that that our that our alcohol vendors do, as far as making sure that they're selling to uh, age appropriate groups of people and, and that sort of thing. But I think that we, we want to approach this from the standpoint of, of some education uh, that we can do and 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 would need to on, you know continue to do in, in future years as well. Um, one of the other things that we've noticed is that um, you know vaping is is a you know is a I don't want to say necessarily preferred, but it's certainly a expedient and uh, you know, easily concealed mechanism for, for you know, for uh, partaking in, in marijuana. And so uh, we put some some vape sensors. There are uh, technology that can identify uh, if vaping is occurring in, say, a restroom. Uh, and we put some of those in place. We we would like to put some additional equipment like that in place. And then obviously over time, we want to continue to maintain that, but essentially expand that. I think there's been some, for those kids that aren't participating in, in vaping of any sort, particularly that of marijuana, you know, they've, they've appreciated having those vaping devices in the places we put them today. Um, I think our staff are able to identify and have conversation with students and, and intercede in a way that's positive and, and appropriate for those kids. And, and it's really not been a terribly punitive kind of thing. It's been more of, of hey, you know, the educational aspect and, you know, this is an appropriate place and, and you know, educating them on the, on the, uh, the risks and having them understand more fully and, and work with them uh, in that regard, and and so I think we want to continue with that. So, uh, in the in the memo from the from the superintendent, you know, he sort of articulated the the short term plans over the next uh, a few months and early into next year, and and the sort of associated amount of funding that we'd need for that. But then I think, uh, you know, I'd be remiss to sort of just do it once and be done. I think we're going to have some ongoing and regular work we're going to want to do. The students are going to continue to cycle into our buildings from. You know, they they uh, some graduate, no one's come in, and so you know it's a it's a process that's ongoing with regard to that uh, educational component and keeping our staff up to speed on on the changing landscape of of, of marijuana use and 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 uh, uh, various you know delivery forms that that become more more prevalent in different kinds and that sort of thing. And I think 
Uh, so for, for those reasons, we think that this would be a good use and, and, and would be really supportive of our schools and, and more importantly, our students uh, in, in you know, making the you know, good decisions and, and being prepared to make the decisions that they, they uh, should be making at 21 about this, but, but certainly in, in the, until they turn 21, understanding the circumstances and, and uh, you know, risks and, and uh, consequences of, of their actions. And so we're hopeful that you'll be able to support this in both the current year and then in coming years as well. And just to clarify, um, the the request isn't for these are the things types of things the funds will be spent on. You're not approving the specific request. You're the action in front of you is to appropriate the funds into a revolving fund, um, and then when it's in a revolving fund, it can be used uh, as needed on these types of expenditures um, going forward. Uh, the host community agreement payments will likely wind down, uh, wind down over the next couple of years to probably be zero at some point um, because of the new cannabis legislation. And so we don't expect this to be a recurring revenue source, but the good news is we've built up enough of a balance that um, we should have a, a funds there to use for the, the you know, several years into the future um, for, for things like this. So let me ask a question then just on what you said a moment ago, and that is, um, are you, um, with special revenue funds, can the decision for expenditure be made as an executive uh, function of the town manager without further council action, or will this come back before the council for expenditure from that fund? This would, uh, no, the, the action by the council would be the appropriation now. Once it's in the revolving fund, then it could be spent by the executive. Okay. Yeah. Lynn? Do we need to vote to create the fund? Yes, and I have, um, that's what the order is. Right. And um, there is a motion. I just want to make sure that there's any questions about what was presented and what uh, just I, now. I don't, the presentation. I don't, yeah, I do have one comment now. It's just that, and I don't want to get into trying to tell the schools the curriculum, but one of the things that is increasingly emerging is um, marijuana that's being sold on the street that's laced with harmful drugs. And uh, perhaps one of the things that we want to teach kids to do is buy from reputable, reputable dispensaries and not buy on the street because of that very issue. So it's just a commentary on what's going on in society today. Matt? Thanks, Andy. This is um, something I've been interested in since we were talking about the impact fees, um, the cannabis revenue during the reparations discussions. Um, I, I support this and will support the motion, but I would just like to have a discussion. Hang on one second. I'm sorry. Um, I would like to know, my, I guess my, my interest is in the public benefit of learning what are we defining as the impact of um, dispensaries so that's you know I, I don't I don't think that anybody wants the council necessarily um, micromanaging managing the program or the funds but I am very curious just some sort of what metrics we wind up drawing to determine impact and and you know what are, in other words what is it that we're trying to mitigate um, mm -hmm. some of that data I think would be interesting to the public good yeah, no, it's a, it's is okay if I respond to that briefly. Sure. Um, it's a good question. Um, you know, there's obviously very tangible impacts, um, like the the vaping curriculum, like uh, police details, impacts on infrastructure. Um, some you know some communities have seen a lot of very tangible impacts. Um, you probably all remember Northampton when they had the lines, you know, around the sidewalk and police details and things like that, um, and then. You know, and then there's the sort of broader societal impacts, which I think are less uh, easy to quantify, but still real. Um, so it is a good conversation. I think it's evolving. Um, cities and towns have done lots of different things or, you know, sort of considered impacts uh, uh, in different ways. And I think we're still evaluating impacts. We've 
chosen to kind of see what other communities are doing and, and hear from departments how they've been impacted. Um, and this is our first sort of request to expend these funds. Um, but, but it is an ongoing question around, you know, how broad are the impacts from dispensaries? I don't know if Paul has any comments himself or if uh, seems not any any further discussion um, and recognize that in recommending then the creation of fund and the appropriation to the fund, uh, we're creating a fund that we're now uh, looking at as it is an administrative function for making the decision on expenditures from the fund. So that um, we should, I will be clear in what I write up for the, uh, on behalf of the committee, if we do this, if this passes, to make that point very clear to the council as a whole. So if there's any discussion on that point, it's appropriate that we have that discussion now. Otherwise, I'm going to proceed with the motion so that we can get on to the next agenda item. Matt. I would just request uh, some kind of mechanism for the town manager to report back on what impacts are being mitigated to the council, I guess. Mm -hmm. I just seen a nod from the uh, manager as he said that. So yeah, that makes sense. That's right. Uh, I'm going to make the motion as, as I have it on a motion sheet. Um, if somebody amends it to be more specific on the point just raised, uh, then that can happen, of course. But I move that the Finance Committee recommend that the Council adopt Order FY23 16A, an order appropriating from free cash to the Cannabis Impact Special Revenue Fund. Or second? Second. Okay, so there's been a motion that's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Um, I'm going to give a real pause here because we just had a discussion about one aspect. Seeing no Andy, I, oh, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, I mean, is and I, I'm not suggesting we do this, but is there an alternative where the council would would actually approve appropriations of these funds, or is that not is that not in the the construct of, of the revenue source? So you could probably make it a stabilization fund if you wanted to have that type of control. Um, it would still separate the funds. Again, we propose this for sort of administrative uh, efficiency and being able to respond to to issues like this one. Um, given everything that, you know, all, all that's in front of the council. Um, but an alternative could be a, another, you know, special purpose stabilization fund, like we've created a couple of them recently. I, I personally would not go that far, but I would just, I would recommend, you know, some kind of a, a public report. So there's a public discussion about the, about the matter. Would you suggest that the committee and then um, ask that the order be amended to include that there be a request uh, with an understanding that the town manager will report uh, as expenditures are made to the council. Yeah, I think that sounds that sounds great, Andy. An ongoing reporting mechanism would be perfect. I mean, I'm willing to make that a uh, an amendment uh, if, if Lynn agrees is a seconder. So Lynn, you have your yeah. Hand I'd up. like to. I'd like it to be that on an annual basis, so, so that it's not considered something that he has to track weekly, monthly, whatever. Annually is more than sufficient. Okay, let's make it on that basis then. So um, we will amend it so that uh, we are um, approving, um, recommending that the council adopt order FY23 16A, 
in order of establishing uh, appropriation from free cash to Canada's impact reserve fund with the understanding that the town manager will report annually, annually to the council on expenditures from the special revenue fund. As, as a seconder, I agree with that. Okay, I'm just writing for a second. I'm sorry. Uh, so with that being said, and that being the motion on the floor, if there's no further discussion, then uh, I'll start with Kathy. Yes, I, yes. I will be a yes, of course. Uh, Alicia's absent. Uh, Anna. Aye. Um, Lynn. Aye. Uh, Bob is absent. Matt. Support. And Bernie. Support. Okay, so again, motion, uh, the, the vote could be summarized as I on the prior motion, so I will uh, not repeat it. So, um, Doug, thank you very much. Appreciate your having been with us and uh, uh, have a good rest of the evening. Thank you so much. Appreciate you all's time and all the work you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice. So uh, let's uh, recognize uh, Guilford if he's still with us. And then uh, we need to take stock of where we're at when, at that point because I know we're getting on in time. Lynn? Mm -hmm. I just want to mention that uh, both Michelle and Alicia are perfectly fine with delaying the item until next next meeting. Okay, I was going to ask that question, um, and um, but let let's go on, and I'm going to actually ask uh, Sean to introduce each of the topics and orders, and then uh, let. Guilford speak to them and uh, the, the first uh, ones I believe, first one I'm looking at it uh, in order, Solid Waste Enterprise Fund. Sure. Um, so there are, yeah, these are all, all Guilford's um, that I get to uh, collaborate with them on. So uh, the first one is the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund. Uh, the one of the biggest expenses for solid waste are tipping fees. It's basically what we pay um, haulers to take trash away from the transfer station. Um, and it's a volatile cost that is tied directly with the price of fuel. Um, so as fuel costs go up, um, or if we just have more people using the transfer station and there's higher quantities, um, the cost goes up. And one thing we saw at the end of last fiscal year, and it trickled into this fiscal year with higher fuel prices or higher tipping costs. Um, so what we are, when we looked at our expense budget, we didn't feel confident, uh, our expense budget in the enterprise fund, uh, we weren't confident we were gonna be able to get through the year on the expense side without having an overage. Um, so we're requesting $25,000 from retained earnings within the sol solid waste enterprise fund uh, for the tipping fees, specifically for the tipping fees, um, but it will increase the expense budget um, to get through the rest of the year. Uh, we've got about three months left to pay for, and I looked at it, we had about $13,000 left. Um, and when I looked at what we spent last year, uh, that's how we got to the number. Um, and if there's anything we don't spend, it just goes back into retained earnings at the end of the year. Um, on the, where it's coming from, so it'll come from retained earnings, uh, which we had, um, uh, sufficient funds to appropriate that amount. And we're going to be putting quite a bit back into retained earnings this year because of the new uh, solar pilot rental revenues that we have in the fund. Um, so we weren't quite sure when the when we were going to get our first rent payment, when they were actually going to do the, the ribbon cutting and the timing of that. It did end up happening this fiscal year, um, FY23. So we received our first uh, rent payment uh, that was not budgeted. So that will go into retained earnings and then we have, we'll be budgeting that going forward. Um, so we will be replenishing, more than replenishing this amount of money um, at the end of the year, uh, just from that revenue source. Uh, Gilford, anything you wanna add on that one or maybe I'll just keep going unless you wanna add anything. 
No, you're doing fine. Okay. All right, so let's take let's take them in group logical groups. Okay. Uh, just to complete them out. Um, Gilford, one quick question, and that is: um, Is there any uh, change now? Is there direction downward in the tipping fees? Uh, no. Tipping fees. We got a notice from one of the one of the disposal sites that um, they're almost doubling the price of for mattresses um, that are considered dirty mattresses that can't be recycled. Those prices have now doubled. Um, so they were sixty dollars, and I think they're going up to one hundred and twenty. So um, the prices are just going up; they're not going down. I only ask because uh, mention was made of fuel costs, and fuel expenses have gone down since they re they were at their peak. Um, other questions of on this item for Gilford to the committee to see if there are any hands and our retained earnings balance um right now is one hundred and ninety nine thousand uh in that fund if there's no discussion no request for discussion then i'm going to make a motion move that the finance committee recommend that the council adopt order 23-04c in order appropriating a supplemental increase to the town of Amherst solid waste enterprise fund operating budget for fiscal year 2023. Second. Second. Okay. So there's been a motion that's been made and seconded, and there's been no request for discussion. I'm seeing no hands going up now. So um, alphabetically, I'm going to start the vote by voting yes and note that. Um, Alicia is absent. Anna? Aye. Lynn? Aye. Uh, no, Mr. Hegner is absent. Matt? Support. Bernie? Support. Bernie, that was a support? Support. And, yeah. Okay. And uh, Kathy? Yes. So again, not the same vote as in prior. You need, you need to, did you do Anna? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, I think yeah. just for the record, Andy, let's just say four members of the finance committee, voting members voted aye, one is absent. Correct. And two members, two, two non-voting members of the finance committee voted to support and one is absent. Yes, and I do note that um, that has been the vote on all um, as they've been recorded and will be re that will be reported fully in um, both the minutes and in um, other in, in the finance committee report. But thank you. Um, so then let's go on and uh, go back to you, Sean. Sure. So we're going to be talking about um, reuse waters. Is that, that the next one? Yeah, the next two, if you're okay with, I'll do as a pair because they're they're somewhat okay. related. Um, right. So these are two, uh, they're both related to borrowing authorizations in the sewer enterprise fund. Um, so the first one is uh, rescinding the balance of the reuse water authorization. It was a, originally a $5 million author authorization. Um, we have spent about 4.7 million. Um, so we want to, or sorry, we've spent about 300,000. We want to rescind about 4.7 million, not to freak anybody out. Um, so we want to rescind the balance of that. And uh, to a public commenter's earlier comment, um, reuse water and billing for reuse water is something that we're going to be looking at over the coming years. Um, and so that, that will certainly be looked at. Uh, and the second one is the gravity belt. So the gravity belt's a critical piece of equipment in the wastewater um, plant. Uh, we originally had an authorization for 2.3 million to replace it. It was sort of bad timing, just like the Centennial Project. I think it was the same year um, where everything we had voted that year came in way below budget because of the um, cost escalation and because of the pandemic um, and just the timing of how it all 
merged. Um, so Guilford's worked with our engineers to get revised cost estimates um, in order to complete that project, which we do have to complete. Um, and we will need about a million dollars more. So it's going to increase the, what we want to do is rescind the original authorization of 2.3 million and replace it um, with a new authorization for 3.3 million to complete the project. Um, and so the net the net here is we're saving about three plus million or so in debt authorized in the sewer fund um, between these two actions. And it will get the Gravity Belt project complete. Guilford, you probably want to add to that. Um, the only thing I'd add is um, the, we, the Gravity Belt thickener is what processes sludge. So if you don't use the belt thickener, you actually just ship out sludge that is just mostly water and it just increases the cost for sludge disposal. So this is a critical piece of equipment that actually thickens the sludge and allows you to ship out more sludge, less water, and saves you money in the long run as long as it's working properly. Bernie has a question. Bernie. Yeah, um, for the, the gravity belt thickener, um, is that eligible for uh, a low interest uh, state loan like an SRF loan, or is that something we're going to have to uh, bond for? It's, it's It would be eligible if we had applied at the time, but um, SRF loans when we were starting this project were kind of hard, and we, we were kind of staying away from them because our interest rate was was good. Um, mm -hmm. And then we're at the process now where if we went out for a SRF loan, we'd delay this another year and a half. No, you, we don't want to. You don't want to do that. No, so, we, we need to get it going, please. I won't make any sludge jokes, but we don't want to do Thank you. Oh, it could get really messy. <laughs> Any more puns? Any more comments or questions? Kathy. I have a an unrelated well, question, but I'm all for doing this. It's when the nicely thickened sludge goes <laughs> leaves us. <laughs> Does anyone work on recycling it and turning it into fertilizer and dirt? Um, I actually saw this happening in Austria in a couple countries, um, and I know this is sewer, but just in, in terms of thinking, where does, I'll stop. I think my question was clear. So um, our sludge goes to one of the two incinerators that burn the sludge and make electricity with it. Um, it goes, mostly it goes to uh, Hartford um, and they use it. And when Hartford uh, is full and won't take it, it, it sometimes goes um, out east to uh, um, Blackstone. Um, there are places that do compost it, but a lot of that's come to a stop now because um, composting sludge and using it for field applications or other such things has actually been one of the causes for spreading uh, PFAS contamination. So it's not um, burning it right now. It's probably one of the better things to do with this, your sludge. Thank you. Okay, anything else in the way of questions at this point? This was uh, unfortunately the three different orders here that we're gonna have to go through really quickly, um, but, I think we have to do them one at a time. I don't know if we if it would really be appropriate to combine them. Do you have an opinion on that, Sean? Um, I think because these are related to debt, um, I would do them one at a time just to make okay. it super clear. Okay. I move that the Finance Committee recommend that the Council adopt Order FY2313D, an order rescinding authorized but unissued bonds originally approved by vote when taken under council order 2109d reuse water change seconds okay um so much has been seconded seeing no hands going up um back to the top of the uh Order and Anna. Aye. Lynn. You're muted, Lynn. Aye. 
Uh, Bob is absent. Matt? Support. Bernie? Support. Kathy? Yes. I'm a yes, and Alicia is absent, so it's the same vote again. Four um, yeses, um, one voting member absent, two resident members in support, and one resident member absent. Um, the next motion would be, I move that the Finance Committee recommend that the Council adopt Order FY2313E, an order rescinding authorized but unissued bonds originally approved by vote taken under Council Order 21-09C, Gravity Belt Thickener. Second. Second. Okay, Lynn seconds. Um, and uh, Lynn, uh, we're going to the vote. Aye. Uh, again, uh, Mr. Hegner, Bob is absent. Matt? Support. Bernie? Support. Um, Kathy? Yes. I'm a yes. Alicia is absent. And Anna? Aye. So it's again for members yes voting members yes one counselor absent and of the resident members two in support and one absent um and the last of the motions in this group is i move that the finance finance committee recommend that the council adopt order fy 2309 be in order approving and authorizing borrowing to fund Capital Projects Bond Authorization for Gravity Belt Thickener. Second. And seconds. Um, and so this time, um, I, I will note that Bob is absent. Seeing no hands going up. Uh, Matt? Support. Uh, Bernie? Support. Kathy? Yes. I mean, yes. Alicia is absent. Anna? Aye. And Lynn? Aye. Okay, so it's four to zero. One council member absent, two in the, the uh, resident members, two in support, and one absent. So we've completed that group. Um, I watching the clock very carefully because it um I think is when when I hit the two hour point I want to adjourn and um, postpone agenda uh, other agenda items to the next meeting unless there is uh, a request to not do so um I'm gonna uh, first of all thank Kilford for having been uh, with us today I don't think that you're in uh, unless uh, you want to stay to the last item. Yeah, he's Gilford's been no, helping okay. support that project. Um, okay, and, um, Matt, uh, your hand is up, so let me. Oh, Andy, I just wanted to, um, since you were talking about the timing right now, I, I realize that we've made this 530 switch. Um, and I just, you know, I guess when I, when I signed up for the Finance Committee, I was definitely I really asked what time the meetings were going to be, and, and that three o'clock slot was sort of something that I could manage. Um, and I'm I am worried that this may not be sustainable for me either. And I realize, you know, the counseling the counselors need to come first in terms of um, finding a time. But but this is a challenge. And I know that we've heard from staff about you know staff hours after yeah, after working hours are done as well. So um, I would just I would just hope that we sort of keep an eye on this and and not fix this as our ongoing time. I realize May is going to be a, a meeting heavy time and we set the cadence for that. But beyond May, I, I hope we can keep this conversation open um, and, and just continue to pull the various members of the committee. Okay, thank you for sharing that. And uh, it is something that we need to revisit. And I was even um, going to bring that topic up eventually, but I think we'll postpone it until the next meeting. 
as, as you gather, I'm trying to uh, set a limit on tonight uh, just because uh, it was 30 and wanted to keep it to two hours if I could. Um, Do you want me to keep going, Andy? Yes, Sean, why don't you go back to the last of okay. the, um, orders that were the, the yeah, I will. And and real quickly, um, if there is a way we could at least set the dates and times that we're going to meet for May, that would be helpful because I want to get um, department heads scheduled um, for the month of May. It's a pretty hectic schedule in terms of lining people up and uh, making sure all the departments get in front of the finance committee. And so I do want to be able to put something in their calendar soon. So if there's a way we could even get the dates um, and the start time set, then I can at least get Get that confirmed. We'll talk um, about that in a minute, but why don't you go ahead and um... yeah. So the last um, the last request is for one hundred ten thousand uh, to demolish the gas station at twenty four Montague Road um, and and make some adjacent site improvements related to the North Amherst Library project. Um, I think the part of this that it, that's a little bit um, unexpected is just the timing of when it would all come together and be completed. Um, I, I think we do agree with some of the comments made by the public commenters. And one of the things I spoke with Paul um, last week about was potentially changing the funding source to uh, repurpose capital. Um, we do have a sufficient balance where we could uh, change the funding source from free cash to that. Um, so I think Paul was totally on board with that. That's change if that's the committee's uh, will. Um, but the but free cash can be used for one-time capital purposes as well. Um, so I'll turn it over to Guilford, who can explain a little bit more about the, the timing of the project and why this is coming up now. So the timing is we're almost done with the library project. We are on schedule. Uh, we're supposed to be done the end of August. Um, when we were talking about wrapping it up and how to open the new library, there was a lot of comments about, well, can we get rid of the gas station and have the whole site in, in the condition it should be in at the end of the project? Right now, if we do not take down the gas station, the project will have a parking lot that's half new and half old. Um, we originally just were going to uh, pave the parking spaces immediately next to the library, and those are going to be the parking spaces. But when we went through site plan review, they wanted a larger parking lot. Um, the funds weren't in the project for that. So what we said was we would use half the old We'd use the, the existing payment that was there and kind of fudge the two together and make a nice to make a parking lot. Um, a lot of people have looked at the library and said, this is a great project. It's looking really good. It would be a shame not to have everything finished when we're done and have half finished and then have more work that has to be done. So the request is really to take down the gas station. Um, the fence um, will be extended where the, the um, Ernie's is storing cars that'll be extended to hide their cars so you wouldn't see the cars and then the space between the fence and the library um, would be regraded seated and loamed and then the parking lot would be complete it would be exactly as approved by the site plan review it'd be uh, 20 I think it's 21 parking spaces is what they approved um, so it would just wrap up the whole project and make it nice uh, there's actually some money in here also for fixing some of the sidewalks uh, next to the property as well and the public way on the state highway and on the um, town highway. So that's also in the in the mix here. So that's kind of what we're trying to do with this. And we're trying to make it so that when we finish this project and walk away, um, we won't have to come back to it and we can go on to the next building projects that uh, we have to work on. What about the question that was raised um, regarding the potential plan? I say that uh, about the potential plan of bringing the roadway across that way and reconfiguring the uh, whole road network. Um, the way we've been working the entire project, nothing being done at the library, including the, the enlarged parking lot that was required, will impact anything we want to do with bringing the road into. Sunderland Road into Montague Road. That won't impact it at all. Uh, removing the garage actually helps move that project along a little bit because that's one thing that has to go away is moving that garage. Um, I'm going to recognize others, and if I want to come back, if they don't raise it, I'll come. Might come back to that a little bit more. But uh, Lynn, so um, 
I heard Sean suggest that uh, the source of funds might be changed and move to leftover capital money. And I, uh, given the observations that have been made here tonight during public comment, seems to me like that's a wise decision. And uh, so my first question is, do we need to reissue this order or can we amend it on the spot? Do you have any thoughts? Paul, do you approve oh, amending it? Yeah, so I, I think the order is the appropriation. Um, the source of funds can be adjusted uh, appropriately okay. you know, as, as the finance committee makes a recommendation. Okay. So I think that's within the framework. Right, thank you. So my next question is, uh, it's been a while since I've looked at the hoped for change to the North, intersect, North Amherst intersection. Are you suggesting that we would not be paving the area that might in fact become a road down the pike, pardon, pardon the pun, I mean, down a road, uh, should we finally change that intersection? Uh, correct. The parking lot for the library will in, not encroach at all on the area that would be needed for the roadway. Okay. And then my final question is, I know that in the past we have applied for uh, Grant, uh, Mass Works grant for this intersection when we were doing North Village, that um, uh, application was not successful. North something was considered too far away. Maybe it's the eruptor. I just know we've applied in the past. Yeah, it was it was North Square. <laughs> yeah, North Square, and we didn't get it. And so, do we see this as a potential now with the new live with the renovated library? and the other uh, project um, up at Ball Lane as an, op as an opportunity again, or are we still looking at Ball Lane being too far away? I think Paul wants to answer that. So when we when we applied last time, after we were rejected, we, put a, we, we really did a, a hard work mm -hmm. to try to get that grant. We had the secretary come down, visit the site. Mm -hmm. We uh, talked with the governor about it. We pulled out all of our stops and it didn't get funded. Um, there, these are grants that are, but for the grant, the project wouldn't happen. Ball Lane is going to happen, um, whether we get a grant to do this or not. I think it's a it's a challenge for us to get a grant. We didn't think this was a competitive um, grant application this year. And actually, quite honestly, we have a lot that we're still digesting through. We have a lot of projects in the in the um, mix right now. Mm -hmm. So pull together a grant application for this without having we without having a high degree of success expectations, we didn't think it was it was valuable to do that. Um, so it, so I don't think that this would be a competitive application. I mean, based if, on everything if North Square. Like yeah, if North Square. Oh, and, the, and just the other thing is we did meet with the um, uh, undersecretary, somebody after the grant application was not approved to understand where the weaknesses were. And that was really what they had told us. Cause we do, when we aren't, when we aren't successful with the grant application, we ask them to come out, talk us through where we could have made it better, things like that. And it was really just the, you know, the traffic counts weren't strong enough to really uh, argue for this. And there were, um, so we just, we didn't have anything that really compelled them to want to fund it at this point in time, at that point in time. And so I would observe that Ball Lane is even further away than North Square. No, no, it's yeah. not. Or Mill no. District. So it's sure it it does seem no, to be heavy. From North Square? No, from Ball Lane is north of the Mill District. Right. Well, right. Yeah, but it's right on but it's right on Montague Road. So so it feeds where where Mill District is off on Coles, you know, just in terms of the, the flow of traffic. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. I, I think we need to respect the decisions of the staff in terms of based on what they've gotten as feedback and the competitiveness. Um, these are not small applications, but I that's just my personal opinion based on years of writing proposals. Yeah, I, think. Yeah, I want to build on this because uh, Pomeroy, the grant you got for Pomeroy, uh, felt like a miracle because the compelling arguments on what was going to happen on traffic, if you drive through there, traffic doesn't feel like traffic ever compared to what we've got up in danger, you know, not just tra tra traffic in danger. So I think the near misses up here 
are pretty severe. So I'm I'm just uh, wondering, Paul, I'm not saying that we could get something and pull it together by June 2nd, because we also don't have full agreement on what it should look like, you know, other than we want to bring that road over. But um, with the smart light and the apparatus getting serious about traffic counts before UMass goes away, um, because this is, we are now getting backed up again, where for a while that light was working beautifully, Guilford, but, you know, the last, and it's only at certain times a day, but um, waiting for three or four changes before you get through the light, and it's so much better than it was, but it used to cross 116, it's getting backed up. So I think we should be um, pulling as much data together, Paul, as possible to make mm -hmm case. And I think one of the things you're going to see on the comments on Ball Lane, people love th this project, but everybody is worried about 44 new or whatever the number of new units is with the potential increase of traffic flow where now that the mill district is full, as opposed to still waiting for people to enter, um, the truck traffic, the delivery truck traffic, the UMass traffic is uh, here, and you would not want to measure it over the summer. <laughs> you don't want you want to be measuring it when you met. So that it's just a real urging of building both conceptually and a database with a compelling argument. So, so my, so my, my. Only one on the 110,000. I mean, we would love to get the library. I'm up when I say we, we're more North Amherst. We would all love it. It's gorgeous. And to get it done. So, Guilford, I know you were pushed by planning to do a lot of parking places. Uh, those of us who use the library were astonished by that pressure because people walk to our library. There's not a lot of uh, parking at the library. So, I also want to think through when you put that pavement down should we ever swing the road in there'll be another place the parking could go if we need that road that intersection to be wider um so just trying to think of how you juggle all of that and i know you, you've got all the maps and you've got the width of it but but just um making sure we don't do anything that infringes on maybe being able to swing it out. And the the, uh, the only last comment I'll make is you you had to do some, I think it was running of the new water line into the bathrooms where Sunderland Road was temporarily, you couldn't go north on it. You you allowed some passage. That intersection was, felt so safe when those cars, when you didn't get that crossing over of cars, it was everyone was saying, maybe we could just continue construction for what <laughs> and keep that barrier up. Um, it was just noticeable when you were trying to leave here or come up here that you weren't getting that coming over of cars. So just trying to think of it as a a real safety, particularly if kids start walk. If you know, we're hoping that some of this housing will have children in it. Um and so just trying to think of paying attention to the counts and getting ready. So that was, that's just my plea on all of this, you know, ga gather better data this time. I mean, we have a way of counting that we didn't before without a special study. We can just count, you know, uh, cars. Thank you. Well, since nobody else is asking to speak, I... <laughs> This is the first that I heard about the number of parking spaces that was required with the permit. And somebody had asked my opinion about that. I would have uh, been astounded because unless one assumes um, huge events going on that are gonna involve lots of cars in the community room on a regular basis, for the library itself to need more than, um, 10 spaces, including street spaces along uh, Sunderland Road as where they are now, uh, would probably uh, exceeds anything that I have observed uh, in the North Hammers library use in all of my years of using it. And I don't think that it is increasing. So I, I, uh, I really I wonder if, uh, uh, that's something that needs some time, some thought. Uh, and uh, the other questions that I have, um, 
just not sure that I'm ready, that I feel comfortable making the motion as it is um, for the order as it is currently worded, because the motion, uh, the order is says, be it ordered, the town council uh, appropriate $110,000 for the um, demolition of the uh, gas station. I'm trying to read through it quickly. And to meet such appropriations, transfer $110,000 from free cash for appropriation. So it does have the transfer built into the order. And if we're going to revisit that question, not the if, but the how funded, I don't think that um, I feel comfortable making the motion. Paul? So I wonder if Sean can come up with draft motion to instead of free cash, what words I could put in there. And I think in terms of the parking requirements, uh, Andy, the the community room, Guilford can correct me, holds 49 people. And I think that's what drove the parking requirements. They were assuming that not if there's an event there for whatever reason, there's 49 people who are going to show up. Uh, they're not all going to walk. And that, that's why I think the, the how they came to that number. The, the, the parking requirement was definitely out of the zoning, directly out of the zoning requirements. And and all the people who live up here said that's too many parking places, Andy. <laughs> you know, even even if we even even if event was there, you know, in terms of the way we've used uh, when we go to the Pine Street co housing and other, uh, the big the big co housing, uh, there aren't it houses forty people and we don't all drive. We walk. Yeah, but it but this is a town wide. Yeah, it, it's not just restricted to North Amherst residency. Anything could be held there. Yeah. Ernie. Yeah, we um, it, it's it's been observed in not just in Amherst but in other places that we tend to overstate yep. need for parking and zoning. Uh, that's a problem that's been addressed in a lot of other places, and we need to think about that. I know from my time on the Transportation Advisory Committee that Guilford's put a lot of thought into the, how we make that whole intersection, that whole interchange of streets better, safer. Uh, trying to walk through there, which I've done, is a horror show. And uh, I, I trust that uh, you know Guilford will come up and its crew will come up with a great plan to do that, which will then be second guessed until for the next <laughs> five years. Um, and, and I think we just need to, we have an umpteen different unsolved um, transportation problems in town. That, and this one should be a priority. And if we have to pay for it, we have to pay for it. Uh, in terms of where the money comes from, it doesn't matter to me. I uh, might as well take it out of free cash rather than try to redo everything. This is the uh, this is what's been published. Uh, at some point, if there's extra money left over in capital appropriations, the council can move it back to free cash. Thank you. So here's a, if you do want to amend the order, Paul, um, in the past when we've, so we use this repurposed capital account from time to time. We used it last year for the um, cost escalation fund um, for uh, inflation. And so it's just, we call it the repurposed capital account, essentially capital that's been closed um, because projects came in under budget. Are there funds sufficient to cover that? Is yep. That... Yep. Yeah. No. There's there was a balance of uh, about five hundred thousand dollars. Some of it's being, um, some of it's being uh, recommended as part of the FY twenty four capital improvement program as well. So um, there's not a huge balance since there uh, to make sure if projects need a little bit more, they can um, they can do that. But uh, we had a project. We had some larger projects close out some funds this year. So um, there's sufficient funding there uh, to cover this. I think that's a much better way of doing it. I agree. Okay. So is there further discussion? Is otherwise, uh, I think I would, would then go ahead with the amended motion language being referenced is the motion would be, I move that the finance committee recommend that the council adopt 
order FY2305 D in order appropriating funds for a portion of the town capital, uh, town of Amherst capital program, demolition of the gas station located at 24 Montague Road and site improvements. As amended? As amended. So the, uh, the, um, Okay, um, adopt order FY2305 D as amended. Second. So we'll add those words into what I made as a motion. So it would read that the motion is uh, that the Finance Committee recommend that the town adopt order FY2305 D as amended an order appropriating funds for a portion of the town of Amherst capital program, demolition of the gas station located at 24 Montague Road and improvements. So that's now been a motion that's made and seconded. Uh, further discussion. Okay, seeing no further discussion, I'm trying to, why don't I just start with Kathy? Because I'm not going to. Yes. I will vote yes. Uh, Alicia's absent. Anna? Aye. Lynn? Aye. Uh, noting that Bob is absent. Matt? Support. Bernie? Support. Okay, so the motion again is uh, four in favor, one voting member absent um, of the three um, resident members, two in support and one absent. Uh, so um, I think that uh, if there's agreement that we're gonna meet on the 25th as planned, then it would make sense to postpone um, the minutes that we plan to do for tonight uh, for the next meeting so that we can turn this meeting tonight. Is there any um, thing that people would like to raise? And the other thing I just want to point out is that we are going to come back then to reviewing committee meeting days and times. But um, I think that uh, unless I, I, the one thing I'd want to hear because Sean has asked for it is if there any feeling about varying the May meeting dates and i have one other topic thing that i just want to alert you to but kathy um i you are you know that the dates that i'm not going to be here i put all those dates that were sent out to us in my calendar so i'm fine but i would just like confirmation soon uh for when i am here and for for next week that 5 30 is is a realistic time um that we re reorganize ourselves for 5.30. Um, so Lynn, whatever you can do to, to get confirmation on that, because we're gonna uh, to have everyone working through their dinner time in May on Tuesdays, if uh, the person who needed the time change can't actually be here um, and staff. So that that's just my request. And, and then the other thing I was just gonna say, since I'm not gonna be here for, the first part of, I will be here for the 3rd of May and then I will be back. I'm willing to take assignments for the days I'm here <laughs> in town. And so you can give me those. And even if I will, I will uh, get my questions or comments on other sections in as quickly as I can. It's just but the poll, I may not have the whole budget book, so I'm going to have to be reading online because um, I'm leaving here on the 4th, and I don't think I want to carry it with me. Um, so so that's just my comment, Sean, on yours. I mean, those all of those dates worked for me, so, for me but now I'm seeing that 530 is 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 a difficult yeah. time for people. So so the way I have it is it's Tuesdays at 530 and they will frequently last till 830. Um, and Fridays at one to uh, one o'clock to four o'clock for most, most of the Tuesdays and Fridays in um, May. And if that's, yeah, if there's no objections, I'll 
we've got sort of a schedule laid out so I can get department heads queued up for that. Um, can I confirm we, um, Andy, I don't know, have you been able to talk to Alicia about the 530 time is, is the, will it consistently not work for her? Do you know? Um, Cause I think that was one of the reasons why we had shifted it. And I think that it's, if it's challenging for other committee members as well, just checking in, cause it sounds like now it, it might not work for her anymore. I, I was the one that spent some time with her. I will check back with her. It was my understanding that 530 was going to work. And okay. Andy and I found out uh, late this afternoon that it wasn't going to work for more than an hour today. So. Okay, but oh, okay. I, I thought I had heard something about that being a continuous thing. Um, Andy, I will let you know that I do have something that has come up for next Tuesday that I will, I will not be able to be here. Um, I may be able to join for the second part of the meeting, but um, I'm not certain. Um, and I apologize for that. I, I found out about it recently. The one thing that I'm going to be asking for responses to at the next meeting is the um, issue that Kathy raised, and that is that uh, we need to decide who is um, interested in what sections of the budget. And there's no reason that that needs to actually wait for a meeting. We're not going to discuss it really at a meeting. So if, uh, I, what I'm probably going to do is send out a request that people send me an email with what their preferences are and uh, to get the information that way and just emails to me. And then I'll report it back to the committee as opposed to having it as a full discussion item. Thank you. And will you also I'll be prepared for that email? I will be prepared. Um, and will you also, when you do that, just kind of give a quick overview of what that entails to make sure that we are adequately prepared to do that job as someone who's new to the finance committee? Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, basically, uh, to give you a, the, the, th the 30 second version is to read to spend extra time on the assigned section uh, in the budget book and uh, to take the lead to make sure that um, core questions that somebody's really giving some thought to the questions that need to be asked about the budget aspects of those sections of government and then to follow up and um, sort of take the lead with the first draft of that section of the um, committee report and uh, I'll send out last year's committee report again so that people can get a sense of how it came out um, and so that's what it's about. And Anna, just on and on the questions is trying to send them in before we meet so that the department head has already seen the questions, you know, so that we can, we, Sean gets us answers to the questions is the other way, you know, that we can have a, a discussion informed by answers to questions, not right. just all ask them. Yeah. Asking them and then, yeah. Thank you. It doesn't get all questions out of the way, but at least it gets a, portion of the questions out of the way in advance. We did something similar at uh, when I was on CPA. It was great. It was a good process. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, is there anything else that people need to uh, tend to tonight? We have two sets of minutes. I should let you know that I went through the minutes and um, I will, the, the edits are really minor and I may just send out the edits and uh, the packet for the next meeting to make it easier because I had it in Word and was able to do it that way, but they're really minor stuff. Uh, so with that, I think we can declare the meeting adjourned and appreciate everybody's participation. It's been a hard meeting, but we got a lot of work done. Night, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Good night, thank you.